Oopsie. Okay. Now the IBM version, I don't, did not come up with that bad information. That was the early version. Uh, and it put all three of the, of the parts of Uncle Roger I told the files onto one disk with an over, over arching menu. So essentially, if you logged on to the IBM version, you got a brief summary of the work. I drank too much red wine. The broad prose party is looping in my mind, nested with brief dreams and nightmares. And then we're going to choose a party in the, in the blue notebook. Choose one keyword and type it in lowercase, exactly as it appears on the list, or to return to the main menu, type stop. It's essentially the main, I didn't change the program a lot other than adjust the, ba this is written in basic, um, IBM basic, PC basic was a little different than Apple soft basic, so I had to change the program a little bit. Okay, choose one keyword and type it in lowercase, exactly as it appears on the list. And so we've done that. Yes. Let's try Jeff. And at that point, you are going to get a series of Lexias. At any point, you can stop and return to the main menu, or you can continue to read the path of Lexias. Now, the way this works, the Blue Notebook itself is composed of, there are five different stories. So it takes a while to unravel all the stories, and we won't be able to do it in the course of this reading. The cafe faced a parking lot. All around the streets were torn up. The cafe was an oasis in piles of dirt, striped barriers, and plank walkways over excavations. It was cold. I stopped writing and finished the coffee. There was some powdered sugar in my sweater. I brushed it off. Jenny? I looked up. Jeff was standing there with a brown plastic tray in his hands. I put the blue notebook in my pocketbook. He set a styrofoam cup full of coffee and an oblong donut on the table and sat down. I wanted to call you. It had been two weeks since the party in Woodside. Every time the phone rang in the Broadthrow's house, I had hoped it would be Jeff. My business with Broadthrow is going badly, he said. I didn't want to call you there. Jeff told me that he grew up in San Jose where his father owned a gas station. Jeff and I sat talking at the table outside the cafe. I had no idea what time it was. My hand lay on the table a few inches from his. Dark, thick hairs curled on his wrists. Our fingers were almost touching. Simultaneously, we stopped talking and looked at the table. I've got to get back to work, he said. Would you like to stop by and see my company? Now, I'd like to stop for just a minute and explain something about what this is about. Uh, this work is appropriate to the early computer platforms. It was written about the chip industry in Silicon Valley and also chip espionage, which is not a hugely known fact. But if you'll recall, the Apple II arose out of a, the Intel's faster chip. First it was the 8008, then it was the 8080. And uh, who could make the fastest chip in the valley was very important. As it happens, at the time, in, in the late 70s, in the mid 70s and late 70s, I was married to a semiconductor engineer. So this work, I think one thing that's nice about this work, is based on experience. I've been inside semiconductor companies, and this is where we're going now. And I know about driving into, you know, you can work in one company and drive into the driveway of the next co another company the next day and be hired on the spot if you knew how to make a fast chip. And people did steal chips. In the broad firm's white Pontiac, I followed Jeff's brown station wagon up First Street onto the highway and along the highway for what seemed forever to Alvarado Drive. We pulled into a driveway where gray buildings clustered closely together. We parked beside a yellow sign that said Micron. A band of yellow paint ran across the front of the low building behind the sign. We went in. No one was sitting in the green chair behind the small front desk in the Micron lobby. A bookcase to the right of the desk was piled with books and thick catalogs. 
On the desk, a tower of advertisements on 4 by 6 cards balanced precariously on top of a stack of blue and white boxes with letters and numbers printed on their sides. We walked through a door into a vast expanse of gray cement floors. There were no windows. The room was filled with rows of benches, which were covered with black and silver equipment. Piles of wires, boxes of small things, what looked like microscopes, TV screens, and big plastic boxes with holes in them. In the back, exposed pipes alienated alternated with 10-foot tall machines. Now I'm going to skip through a few of these screens because we don't, because it's a short reading. Four or five, and I'll read just a little bit. Four or five women were bent at intervals over the benches, peering through microscopes, putting white plastic gloved hands in the holes in the plastic boxes while looking intently at grainy black and white pictures on TV screens. They were wearing white coats. Okay, let's skip that. Poster of Ronald Reagan with Bonzo in the movie Bedtime for Bonzo was tacked next to a faded list of warnings about the hazardous effects of various substances. Hazardous effects of various substances. Jenny, I've got to take care of a problem, Jeff said. I'll go now, I said. Please wait, he said. His eyes were dark brown. He showed me his office. A small cluttered cubbyhole. His desk was piled with computer printouts, advertisements, books, manuals, and tattered letters. There was a computer beside the desk.